Let's go to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. That really might be your favorite. <laughs> Romans chapter 10. Last week, we dealt with some very simple, basic Bible doctrine. And I suppose this week we'll go along with that in some way. They fit together. Last week the doctrine that we discussed and I preached was the fact that Jesus is the only way. There is no other way. Matters not what the religions of this world and what man says, that there's many ways to God and all the religions of the world are simply climbing up the mountain on the other side or another way. The Bible is crystal clear. The fact that Jesus is the only way. According to His own words. What's wrong? Oh. According to the very words of Christ. Now, that's if you believe the Bible. If you don't believe the Bible, not much I can do for you. Amen? I can't help you much. If you don't have some core belief that that's God's book and that's God's word, not much I can do for you because you don't believe what God said. You know, many are in that position right now in their life. They don't believe one word of the Bible. And I think that comes from the fact that they don't believe there's a God. <laughs> we are living in a generation they don't oh, they don't only believe that they don't only not believe the Bible, they don't believe there's a God. So the first step in getting someone to believe the Bible is to first get them in the position where they believe there's a God. If you don't believe there's a God, you are blind. You know, this world, this politically correct generation we live in, that's, you know, everyone supposedly is open minded. They call us, we're, we're too closed minded, meaning that they're open minded. Where are all these open minded people this morning? Why aren't they here? Maybe there's a different viewpoint. Maybe there's something that they're missing. I can tell you this. I was where they were at, and I'm not missing anything. <laughs> when I was where they were at, this is what I was missing. Then I got a hold of this and found out this is what I've been missing. <laughs> yeah, it was dirty. I got a hold of the truth, and it made me free. Made me free. So last week I preached a whole message and we dealt with the fact that Jesus is the only way, according to the Bible. The only way. And as the church and as the body of Christ and as individual Christians, we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. That's a ministry. The power is in Christ. We've been given the ministry to take people and introduce them to Jesus Christ. We're just ambassadors. We're just go-betweens. Here's Jesus. Let me show you Him. Look at Him. All right, Jesus, here He is. We're just fishermen. Jesus cleans them, cooks them, <laughs> you know, he prepares them, he takes care of them. We just catch them. So here, Lord, here you go. I believe Jesus saves. I do I believe that. He saved me. I believe Jesus saves, and I believe that a man must be saved. And Jesus is the only way. And I believe when Jesus saves, He saves the soul for all eternity. Forever. 
Not until your next mistake. Right? For all eternity, when Jesus saves. Oh, happy day. You know why I like that song? It says day. Oh, happy day. I believe when Jesus saves, He forgives and He forgets all sin. It's cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. I believe that Jesus gives eternal life and you'll never perish. And the reason I believe this is because the Bible says it's so. It says it's so. If I didn't believe that, I'd get out of the ministry. Shut the doors. Shut the doors. What is the purpose of the church if it's not engaged in the winning of souls and the introducing of the sinner to the only one that can save them from their sin. If that is not the core purpose of the church, what is the purpose of the church? What is it? It's the purpose of the church. Help you to better your life so you can be a better you, right? Make the world a better place for all those Joe Osteen titles, right? Your best life now. <laughs> all these philosophical things that the church has taken on as their purpose Right, to be a better you, to have a better life, and to have a better marriage, and all these things. The world can help you with all those areas. The world can help you in those areas. The world can help you with your finances, and your marriage, and your children, and your life on this earth. But the world will never point you to the Christ that died and was buried and resurrected. The world will never show you the way to salvation. They'll lead you away from it. They'll keep a man from it. The world will never show you the way to justification and redemption and reconciliation and sanctification. The world will never show you that way. The world doesn't know that way. That's the way that God has given to us to show to them. That's the responsibility of the church. It's for this cause that Jesus died to save sinners. <laughs> See how simple that is? And yeah. these churches and this world just complicates everything. So we have masses of people walking through church doors and attending churches because they want their life better and their marriage better. And those are good things. You can get help in all those areas and still go straight to hell if your sins are forgiven. I'm all for helping people out. Hey, if you need help with your marriage, you need help with your finances, you need help with anything in this life, we're here to help you. But I can tell you this, in helping anyone in those areas, the, the thing that's going to be constantly on my mind, I wonder if they're saved. We've got to deal with their salvation. You leave this life without Jesus Christ, a man leaves this life without Jesus, no matter how good his kids are, no matter how good his marriage is, no matter how good his finances are, he loses it all. If the responsibility of the church and the purpose of the church and the main goal of the church is not to engage souls for Jesus Christ and the winning of souls, what is the purpose? And don't tell me the churches are, in, are just vigorously engaging souls preaching the gospel around this world. Show me. I want to see it. We are God's called out assemble. assembly. That's what church means. A called out assembly, right? Ecclesia. Ooh, Greek. <laughs> you know, <I'm> smart. <laughs> God's called out assembly preaching the good news. Jesus Christ. Saves. Now, if Jesus saves, which he does, 
how is it that so many are lost? If Jesus saves, and he does, how is it that so many are lacking salvation? How is it that so many are so very far from God? I don't get it. If Jesus saves and salvation's a free gift, which it is, how is it that there are so many without hope and without God in bondage to their sin and bondage to their religion and bondage to their traditions and they won't forsake all those things and just take the free gift of eternal life? How is that? I'm sure you could come up with a long list of the reasons that there are so many without Christ. You could probably come up with a long list. Men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. Right? Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. They love their pleasures. They love their life more than they love their God. People just don't care. They're just not concerned anymore. They're numb, apathetic. They just don't care. They think their righteousness... See we, could, see, we could come up with a long list, couldn't we? And that's then. Then you could deal with the church. Right? The church has dropped the ball. Christians have lost their passion for souls. The, the church quit going. You know, gospel, G-O. Right? Go. I, I, when, I was, when I was preparing this, I thought about the whole armor of God. And part of the armor of God is the feet shod with the gospel of peace. Prepared. Preparation. The feet shod with the gospel of peace. Now, how's that part? How does that kind of fit in with this armor? With this armor protection? How is my feet shod like shoes covered? How is my feet covered with the gospel of peace? How does that protect me? How is that weaponry? How is that a protection? Huh? How, how's that part of the armor, the whole armor of God that protects me? I can tell you this. You shod your feet and you prepare your feet with the gospel and you take the gospel of Jesus Christ with you, put them on your feet, it'll keep you from becoming complacent. It'll keep you from com becoming idle. It'll keep you from heading uh, in the wrong direction, ending up in the wrong place or behind enemy lines without a plan. If my feet shot with the gospel of peace, you know what I could do? I could walk into the old bar, not be tempted by anything with a goal in mind. All right, I'm going to go in here. I'm going to pass out some tracks. Anything wrong with that? You think there'd be anything wrong with that? What if your feet aren't shot with the gospel and you're tempted and you walk in that bar without the gospel, without that motive, without... <laughs> You'd end up just joining them. Like the military. You be careful of that too. A lot of Christians, a lot of Bible believing kids join in the military. Why? Why are you join the military? Did God call you? It's your ministry? I'm not saying God doesn't call some people to go into the military. But if you're buying into all that, we're going to give you money, we're going to give you this and give you that, you better watch out. <laughs> watch out. <laughs> give you a lot of stuff. You better watch out. I'm sure God calls some Christians to go into the military, and guess what? They go in, and they keep themselves clean and pure, and their motive and their feet in joining the military are shod with the gospel of peace, and they take the gospel with them, and it keeps them from going down the wrong path. Amen. That'll protect you. You put, you put the gospel on your feet, that will protect you. That brings me to my point this morning. Why is it that there are few coming to Christ. Why is that? Listen, they are not coming in droves. <laughs> it's not like the revivals of old. Why is it that there are few coming to Christ today? Like I said, we could have a long list. We could have a long list. But just let me give you one. The reason few are not coming to Christ, this may not make sense until I explain myself, 
The reason that few are not coming to Christ is because they are not coming to Christ. You can't say that only a few are attending churches. There's a lot of people attending churches. <laughs> Aren't there? A lot of folks attending churches. There is a lot of folks in Sioux City right now in church. But are they coming to Christ? That is not evident to me. I don't see the fruit of that. Do you? Do you see the fruit of people coming to Christ and being transformed and made new? The next time you see one that really gets it, you'll know. You're like, man, what got into that? I mean, by Jesus, amen. <laughs> Don't be ashamed. This is what I believe. I believe every soul, every soul that has ever come to Christ for salvation, Jesus saved. Everyone. Every single one, without exception. Show me one in the Bible that came to Christ for help and Jesus turned away. Show me one. You have that Gentile, that Gentile woman that comes to Christ. You know what she says? This is what she said. Lord, help me. Notice she acknowledged him as, Lord, help me. You know what Jesus said? He said something along the lines of this. It's not for me to give the bread of my children to dogs because she was a Gentile. You know what she said? Even the dogs eat from the crumbs that fall off the master's table. And the Lord said, man, you got some faith there. Your daughter's healed. Bam. <laughs> There's an exception, isn't it? She said, Lord, and this is a Gentile. When Jesus at that time during his ministry was only dealing with the Jews and the nation of Israel, and a Gentile woman, a dog, came to her and convinced the king of kings to cast some of that bread, just a crumb, her way by her faith and her call to him. Lord, help. Jesus accepts all who come to him. This is a, this, listen, this is, a, this is a serious issue. You know why? Because they're not coming to him. They're attending churches. They're filled up right now. But men and women are not coming to Christ. Because when you come to Christ, He saves every single time. Do you know this? A man can come to church and never come to Christ. A man can come to his senses and change his ways and never come to Christ. A man can come to another man for spiritual guidance and never come to Christ. A man can come to a religious experience and never come to Christ. Happens all the time. He touched me, I felt a shock, and I fell down. Listen, and that's their salvation. Are you saved? Yeah. He touched me, I felt a shock, and I fell down. No, are you saved? Have you been born again? Have you come to Christ? He touched me, I felt a shock, and I fell down. And I started speaking in some gibberish that no one understood. You think I'm lying? I've heard it with my own ears. You can be saved from a near-death experience and not come to Christ. And I've heard that over again. Are you saved? Yeah, I was in a car accident and God saved me. I'm not talking about your flesh. Are you, is your soul saved? Have you come to Christ? Because if you came to Christ... He saves all that come to Him. Everyone. He never turns it away. He'll never turn you away if you come to Christ. Never. 
never forsake you. He'll never forsake an honest, from the heart, call to him. It's important. This is being forsaken. You know how I know it's been forsaken? Jesus is being talked about all over this city and all over this world, but they're not coming to Christ. Missing the point. You know, a man can repeat a million prayers and never come to Christ. Man can... A man can attend a, a, a dynamic service where it's just like, whoa, moving, and never come to Christ. Salvation is only the result of a sinner coming to Christ. So let me repeat myself again. The reason few are, coming, are not coming to Christ is because they are not coming to Christ. Why does the Bible warn us of those that would preach another Christ and another gospel? Now, get this. Do you know what another Christ and another gospel is? It's a substitute. It's a substitute. Do you, yeah, very satanic. Do you know what substitute sweetener is? <laughs> well, number one, it might kill you, aspartame and all that. It's a substitute for... Sugar. What's, what, what's a sugar substitute? Give me one. What? Sucralose. That sucralose will never be sugar. It will never be the real thing. Jesus is one man. He's one Savior. There's only one salvation. There's only one Lord. There's only one spiritual baptism. There's only one Holy Spirit. And there's only one way. And the way to salvation is coming to Christ. Not a religious experience. Not a repetition of prayers. Not a, a dynamic a church a service. Not a feeling. I can't save a soul. I, have no, I don't have that power. No man does. But I can bring them to Christ. And when I bring them to Christ and I show them the Gospel and what Christ did, whether or not they enter into a dialogue with Jesus Christ has nothing to do with me. I've, get, I've introduced them and here, here's Jesus and here's the way. Whether they enter into conversation with Jesus is between them and God. You can lead a horse to water. That all our job is to lead them to the water. You can't make them drink. This is all you got to do. Just repeat after me. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> what? With salvation, no man can speak for another man. With salvation, no man can speak for another man. I'm going to turn to my chart again. Right here. You had men speaking for other men. You had men mediating for other men. You had priests right here mediating for other men interceding for other men. You had priests that had the power by God to intercede for other men. But what happened right here? That's, he, Jesus is called the great high priest. He's the final priest. And the final sacrifice was made right there. Now we're right here. There's only one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. Not here. <laughs> that priest could mediate for that man. That priest could mediate for the whole nation. That priest could offer the sacrifice for the sin. If that priest didn't offer that sacrifice for the sin of that person, that was his job. So that that person's sin could be covered. So that person's sin could be forgiven. 
They had men as mediators right there. Right here? We have one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus, and all our job is, is to lead them to the water. That's it. That's all we're called. That's, that's all we can do. Whether or not that they whether or not they have a personal dialogue with the King of Kings and conversion takes place, that's between them and God. It's one on one. That's, that's when salvation occurs. It is one on one. You know why this is so important? Because a great number of people with a religious experience orchestrated by a church, a great number of people with the repeating of a prayer, a great number with a near-death experience, they have these as their testimony of salvation. I haven't talked to very few. And I ask them, are you saved? And they say, you know what? I was so-and-so years old and I got down on my knees. Just me and God. And I came to Christ. It was just me and Him. And I cried out to Him. And I asked Him for help. And I asked Jesus and I called upon the name of the Lord. And I believed the Gospel. And I believed what He did for me. And I'm trust. How often do you get that? How often do you get a religious experience or a prayer or traditions or everything else? Jesus saves those that come to Him. It's called faith. That's what pleases God. It's called faith. It can be difficult for someone to let go of everything temporal. To let go of everything physical that they've been trusting in in hopes that God would be pleased with them. It would be difficult to let go of all that and just fall into the hands of the living God and say, Jesus, you see, I'm talking to Jesus. Do you get it? I'm talking to Him. Jesus, you're my only hope. Salvation, bam! When you come to Christ. Let me help you understand. If I say, Carl, who am I talking to? Am I talking to anybody else in here? No. Okay. Am I being influenced by anyone no. to call upon Carl? No. Am I calling upon Carl on behalf of someone else? No. no, I'm calling upon Carl. When I say, Carl, he looks at me and he awaits response. If I were just to say, Carl, and then stop and not say anything, wouldn't that be a little rude? Wouldn't that be a little strange? Or maybe look off in some distance. Carl. <laughs> when I say Carl, he's expecting a personal... I'm not talking to anyone else. I'm not talking to you guys. I'm talking to him. A personal conversation. What does it mean to come to Christ? What does it mean to call upon Him? What does it mean to call upon His name? Now look at Romans chapter 10. Look at 9. Here we see the power of salvation. Let me say this. The power of salvation is not in a church. It's not in a religion. It's not in traditions. It's not in the efforts of man. It's within, packaged nice and neat, in the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of salvation 
to everyone that believeth. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, look at verse 9. The, do you see the name here? The Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. You might be saved, or maybe you hope so. Thou shalt be saved. The power of salvation is packaged neatly within the gospel of Jesus Christ, His death, burial, and resurrection. And I understand it just mentions His resurrection here, but you can't believe in the resurrection unless you believe in the death. What precedes the resurrection? The cross. Having faith in the resurrection is showing that you have faith in why He died and the purpose for His death. That's the power of salvation. It's in the gospel, the cross. How about the place of salvation? Where does salvation take place? Look at verse 10. For with the heart... Man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The place of salvation is not a physical place. You know, there's millions around the world that believe they have to enter into a physical building to find God. Millions. They have to enter into a temple or a shrine or a church or whatever else, a mosque or whatever else it might be to find God or to have interaction with God. They have to enter into a spiritual, religious atmosphere in order to have dialogue with God, in order to converse with God. They have to go to a physical place. But the Bible says here that the place of salvation is within the heart. So any place you, you take your heart with you, you can talk to God. <laughs> that makes sense? And that's why Jesus said to go into the closet. Most people probably did not put their idols in their closet. They put them out for show. It's not much in the, there's not, there's not many points of contacts in the closet, right? It's just you and a closet. And then one other thing, God. That's where Jesus saves. Doesn't he come within? That's the place of, I'm saved. I'm saved right in there for all eternity. That's the place of salvation. How about, look at verse 11, the principle of salvation for the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. The principle of, the sal of salvation is faith. That's the principle, faith. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Verse 9, believe. Verse 10, believe. It's verse 11, believe, right? Faith. Through faith in what? Let me give you a few. The Bible says through... Now think about this. Through faith in His name. In His name? Huh? In his, I thought we were supposed to have faith in death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We are. That's the power. The Bible says that you're to have faith in His name. You know when a sinner comes to Christ and they say the name, Jesus, faith in his name, Jesus. And it's just them and Christ. And that sinner is talking directly to G without any interference, without any coaxing, without any script. And that sinner comes to Christ and says the name above every name, Jesus, from way down deep in his heart, says that name, 
calling upon him by faith. Jesus. You know what Jesus does? Boom. <laughs> Hello. Somebody is calling me. Yeah. The principle of salvation is faith. The Bible says through faith in his name, through faith in his blood, justified by faith, purified by faith, sanctified by faith. We have access by faith and so many more things by faith. Look at verse 12 and 13. We have the power of salvation within the gospel. We have the place of salvation is in the heart. We have the partaker of salvation. Look at verses 12 and 13. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Calvinist must have missed that one. The whosoever. Who's the partaker? Who is the partaker of salvation? The powers in the gospel. The principle of salvation is faith in the gospel. The partaker of salvation is whosoever. Whosoever. I like that song. Whosoever surely meaneth me. Right? Doesn't that mean you? Doesn't that mean them? Doesn't that mean anyone? Whosoever. Who's the partaker? Whosoever. But get it. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. What's the name of the Lord? Well, right now it's Jesus. <laughs> yeah, the Lord. It ain't, it ain't all. It's That's Jesus. the name of the Lord. Let me say this again. Why aren't people coming to Christ? The reason that people aren't coming to Christ is because they're not coming to Christ. It's almost like there's always some other entity involved in their salvation. And it's not just them and Jesus. Or maybe some of you folks have wondered why I don't have like altar calls and stuff like that. I'm not into conning or coaxing people. I'm just, that's just not me. Maybe other ministries do that. You know, raise your hand, sit down, do this, look up at me. Blah, blah, right? They do that stuff. I was in churches like that. Do some souls get saved? Yes. yes. Do some souls come down here and someone gets down and say, just repeat after me. They get them under a guilt trip. They take this long invitation. It's, you know, the, the service isn't a success unless someone comes down to the altar and we get someone to raise their hand. They put them under a guilt trip. Come on, raise your hand, raise your hand, raise your hand, raise your hand. If you've never been saved, if you don't know you're saved, right? If you don't know the exact time and the date and the minute and the second that you were saved, right? And then finally someone like, and then they try to count them and everybody else is like, oh my goodness, man. And then they finally get them down here, right? And then they have this repetitive prayer. Just say these words. And then the person gets up and they said the words and they had a religious experience. And then someone else asks them if they've ever been saved. Guess what? They'll say, yeah, I came down the altar and I repeated these words. I'm saying you can have a religious experience and not come to Christ. Coming. Coming. Look at what it says. They call upon the name of the Lord. No one else is involved except them and God. That's it. <laughs> That's where faith is involved. That's where faith is involved, right? I'm not ashamed to say I believe and I'm trusting wholly in a man I've never seen, I've never heard, I've never touched. And I personally talk to him all the time. Just like I'm talking to you right now. Just like I say Thane. And you look up me and we talk. <laughs> I'm talking to my God the same way. That's faith. Yeah. That's faith. That's how someone has to come to Christ. All you can do is just lead them there. 
to hear Jesus take them. Whether they drink or not, there's nothing we can do about that. I'm not, I'm not in this for numbers so I can write in a bulletin how many we had baptized. I want to see real salvation. I want to see Paul, like Pauline salvation, like light from darkness to light. We're not seeing that, people. And you can come up with a long list. But I know this, it comes down to this. They're not coming to Christ. That will give you every religious experience and every other thing. They're not coming to Christ. It's a personal call. It's not a scripted call. It's not scripted. You think of a... Like if a child comes to Christ, you think a child has this long dialogue and like all this intricate stuff or it's just real simple. Like, I'm lost. I know what you did for me, Jesus. Save me. And that, that child is talking to Jesus and that's the only person. That is the only person within that conversation. It's the child and Jesus. And Jesus is like, that's the one. Right there. They're actually talking to me. Jesus saves everyone that come that way. Every single one. But it's getting people there to understand that. It's hard to get someone to forsake all these physical things that they're trusting in. It's like when a telemarketer calls, right, and they have their script. How many, how many here are just, just so interested? Like, oh, I want to see what this telemarketer has to say. I'm like, <laughs> what, I mean, when a telemarketer calls you, it's not a personal call, right? right? Like they're really concerned for you, and you're really concerned for them, and you're really talking. <laughs> no, you're just listening to their script. That's why I just hang up. <laughs> so what happens when someone comes to Christ and they just got this script, right? <laughs> I think Jesus thinks. That's not coming from them in their heart, from their heart of hearts. What did the thief on the cross say? Lord. Lord. Now, who, who's he talking to? Was it scripted? We not talking to anybody else on the whole planet. Sure. He looked over at Jesus and said, Lord, remember me. Jesus said, how, how long did it take Jesus to answer the call? Bam! Today, you'll be with me in paradise. I bet the thief was like, what? I wasn't expecting that, but I'll take it. Amen. And he didn't even get baptized. Wasn't baptized. Whoa. How about Paul, Acts chapter 9? Jesus shows up. Paul, Acts chapter 9. He asked Jesus a question. Who art thou, Lord? You got it right, buddy. You know what Jesus said? That's what he said. I am Jesus. The name, the name. He used the name. You want to be a nut? You want to be a, uh, just a crazy nut for Jesus? Just say the name of Jesus. Just tell people, I love Jesus. Watch them go, ugh. <laughs> like, crazy, man. It's crazy to love Jesus? What? <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> oh, crazy to, that's the greatest thing ever. When was the last time someone came up and said, I, I love Jesus? You know why? Because they don't love Jesus. Yep. 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 Right there, that she just 
Yeah. You know, when Jesus said to Paul, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest, it says that Paul was trembling and astonished. And he said, Lord? <laughs> say, when was Paul saved? I think he was saved right there. Because the first Lord was a question. The next one was like, Lord Jesus. He put a name. Jesus put the name to the Lord. And then Paul recognized Jesus as, that's the one. How long did it take Jesus to change him? <laughs> All the Christians were like, what? <laughs> that, that's not Paul. That's like I was trying to kill us. Now he's on our side? That quick? Darkness, light. Right? How about Peter walking on water? You know what he said? Jesus come walking on the water. Say, so you believe that? With all my heart. He walked on the water, amen? Peter saw Jesus and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. Jesus said, you know, Jesus said, come unto me. Jesus didn't say, come unto a religion. Jesus said, come unto a feeling, come unto a religious. He said, Come unto me. Me. Peter said, and it was solid. Then he took his eyes off the Lord. You know what he said? You know what he said after he began to sing? Lord, save me. And I love the next two words. And immediately, Jesus stretched forth his hand. You know, he could have taught Peter a lesson. Lord, save me. I will a little bit after you learn your lesson, bud. Don't ever take your eyes off me. That's not how Jesus saves. That's how religion says salvation is. You know, you've got to keep all these commands and do all these things. and You've got to jump through all the hoops. And maybe you'll be saved, you know, hopefully, possibly. You know, I know that I'm saved. I know whom I have believed. I know that I've passed from death into life. I know that. What's better than that to know? You know that's called a sin in the Catholic Church? It's called the sin of presumption. Look it up. I'm just telling you what they say. To presume that you're going to heaven. I, I'm living in sin. Because I say, I, I know. Paul said he knew. Did Paul say, absent from the body, present with the Lord? Did Paul say, I'd rather depart and be with Christ, with, which is far better? Did Paul know? He was a murderer. Isn't that, what's that sin called? Like when you, like, you got venial sins and you. Paul said, I'm saved, man. Did Paul prove that he was saved? He gave his life. Did Jesus save him? Changed his, changed his direction was, it's not 360, it's 180. Right? He was going that way and then he went total opposite. Changed. You know why? He had a personal encounter with Jesus and he called upon the Lord. Jesus answers to that call. That's the power of salvation, the place of salvation, the partaker, the promise, and the person. How about the preacher of salvation? Look at verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Who's the preacher of salvation? Not just me. All that have ever come to him can also preach him. 
That's any man, woman, or child. Willing to let it be known that Jesus saved. One of the reasons when we're out evangelizing, our emphasis and our focus is bringing people to Christ. We don't have a big sign out there, White House Baptist Church, you know, with my picture on it, you know. (laughs) Promoting us. We don't, we don't preach Lighthouse Baptist Church. We preach Jesus. Preach Jesus. We introduce people to Him and hope they call upon Him. Why aren't they calling upon Him? Because they're not calling upon Him. Why aren't they being saved? Not talking to Jesus. It's not with their heart. But they can t- they can tell you a religious experience. Almost every one of them. They could give you some kind of explanation. But it's few and far between now when someone gives you the the Bible way to salvation. I called upon the name of the Lord and He saved me. I talked to Jesus and now He talks to me. Every time I open that up, He talks to me. He feeds me. Can you think of anyone in this life you would rather talk to than Jesus? If you have the opportunity to sit down and interview or just have a conversation with any man that has ever lived, if you didn't pick Jesus, you are crazy. (laughs) You have lost your mind. I'd rather talk to Muhammad. That murderer, child molester. (laughs) You'd rather talk to him, huh? Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin, right? His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. He paid for them all. He paid for them all. Not to mention, the Bible says if we've broken the law in one point, we're guilty of them all. So I've never burned anybody, but you lied. Uh oh. <laughs> you're guilty of them all. The Bible yeah. says if you hate your brother, you're a murderer. The Bible says you look at a woman or look at a man with lust in your heart, you committed adultery. You know what that means? A lot of, a lot of people are guilty. You know why Jesus, you know why God puts those difficult verses in there like, oh my goodness, then who can be saved? With man, it's not possible. With God, all things are possible. The reason those things are in there are like, show that to someone sometime. <laughs> They'll be like, we're all doomed. There's one way, but there's only one way. I can show you. I can show you a way out. And then they see their only hope. Their only hope is Jesus. Their only hope is that they personally call upon Jesus and talk to him without any kind of interference whatsoever, any outside source. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, it's like they say on the radio or TV when there's a tragedy, you know, we're praying for you. What are you praying to? <laughs> Don't go praying to Buddha for me or a mom or <laughs> Get saved. Get saved. Does that make sense according to the Bible, what I just preached? That's salvation. Personal. That is salvation. The root of it is right there. I just want, I want people to get saved. And I, I don't know how else to do it. And I don't know how else to do it and not violate my conscience. But then what we're doing right now. Say, but the church isn't full. I'm not, I'm not interested in that. If that was my thrust and that was my, my goal is to fill the church up, I could come up with some ways. But my conscience... You know, I, I don't know if there's anything necessary too much wrong with, you know, having a meal or something like that. Maybe we could do something like that if we had better facilities. You know, if we had better facilities and stuff like that. Yeah, that would be nice for the, you know, but man, you start conning and coaxing people right, and exactly. getting them in the church because they they think they're going to win something or... <laughs> you know? But that is, that is a lot of the philosophy of the churches now. And, and, and it comes from the fact because they're not going out. So no one in the church is going out doing anything. So in order to fill the church, we have to attract them in. And I just, I'm just not into that, man. I've been in churches like that. We're just going to go out. Oh, yeah. I suppose. I suppose. You know, you know, first Sunday of the month we have like a, a, a potluck. And you know, invite some folks on the first Sunday of the month and say, you know, after the service we have a dinner. But you know what comes before the, ser before the, the meal? <laughs> That's the emphasis. It's a preaching. It's a preaching. Oh, yeah. That's the 11th commandment. What's that? According to the thing, thou shalt potluck. <laughs> thou shalt potluck. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we better let Tammy out of the nursery in an hour. All right, praise God. Let's pray. Father, we do love you, Lord God. And Lord, I pray that every, each individual here, Lord, I pray that they know that they're saved, Lord. If they're saved, Lord, they wouldn't be ashamed. Lord, and like it says, that if thou shalt confess with the mouth and believe in the heart, Lord, that confession of the mouth is made unto salvation. Lord, if there's someone here that's never, that's, if there's someone here, Lord, that's saved, they know that they're saved and they've never told someone else that they're saved. Lord, I pray, Lord God, that they just uh, tell someone, Lord, I'm saved. Lord God, we thank you, Lord, for the salvation of souls. Thank you for giving us eternal life and giving us that assurance to know for sure that heaven's our home. Lord God, help us to trust your promises and just lean upon you, Lord, and to walk your way, and to walk by faith. Lord, forsake this world, forsake this flesh, forsake the temptations of this world. Lord, and just live for you. That's where the joy and the peace and all those wonderful things are. It's within a relationship with you. Lord, I pray for the salvation of souls. Lord, use us, use this little church to be a lighthouse to point people to Jesus Christ, their only hope. Take every track, Lord. Take every witness and do something with it, Lord. I, pray, I know it won't return void. Please use us for your honor, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.